in March or April, uh, uh, I was called to London and much surprised by Morrow and made his successor as chief European correspondent. So then I went back and, um, and pulled all my uh, gear together and left. The person was there for the whole time. I think Cronkite was there for the whole period. The whole time? Yeah. Well, I'm hoping to talk to him. Um, can you uh, reconstruct for me your arrival in this smash yeah. city? I had uh, been sent back to Berlin. I, after, when the war ended, I came to, went to New York for the first time in my right. life to see my employers and to see if I had a job. And uh, I assumed I didn't have a job, so I went to Life magazine. They said they wanted me pretty much, so I went to see Murrow, and I said, uh, I, I'm, uh, I've got a job, so I'm safe. And he said, oh, no, you've got a job here. You're going to stay here, and I'm going to put you in my place. So they sent me to Berlin first. Yeah. And uh, I was there for about two months. And then John Scott was representing time. I had a limousine, and he was going, so I drove with him through the night to Nuremberg. And we put it up at the Faber Castle. Right. The pe pencil makers, you know. Right. Provided I got one right here. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And um, then we, the city was a wreck, just a terrible wreck, and unsafe in the evening. And I, uh, I don't know how much my personal problems uh, uh, affect this, but I might as well tell them to you. I, uh, I was the correspondent on the spot. I was informed that Bill Shire was coming and he would do part of it. I was informed Ed Morrow was coming, he'll do part of it. And Eric Severide said, I want to come. So I began to get worried that I wasn't going to have anything to do at all on my spot. In fact, when the trials began, I, uh, none of them came except Shire. Right. And he got <clears throat> flu as soon as he arrived, so I had to do all their broadcasts. And I had to get up early in the morning to get to the courthouse. And I had to stay there all day because the latest broadcast was at midnight. So I, uh, I really had a rough time. But uh, the most impressive parts of the trial to me were the beginning when they were all asked how they pled. And uh, Hess refused to take part. He simply withdrew from it. And after a few days of the trial, uh, he asked to make a statement. And he indicated he was very impressed with the fairness. And so he would take part. <laughs> I, I was impressed with that. Then second, and most impressive of all, <clears throat> was the failure of Robert Jackson as the chief prosecutor. He saved his uh, performance for Goering, and the two titans met head on. And Jackson was so ineffective, he lost his temper. It was an amazing come down for a man. I thought the, uh, the Attorney General there was on the Supreme Court. He'd been, he was Supreme Court Supreme at that Court. point. And the performance was awful. Everyone was disappointed. And uh, those are the only two things I remember. The, film, the first time the film was shown of the bodies stacked like cordwood and being shoved around by a bulldozer in the yeah. concentration camps. And they all watched it, except shock, turned the other way, yeah. and looked it into the audience, into the courtroom. Um, for the rest, the bits of information that came out were, were, were impressive. Bill Shira could not stay very long, and he was going back. He said, can you take, get all the handouts every week and mail them to me? And I tried it for a couple of weeks. It was too much fun. Yeah. So I asked the staff at the trials, could they do it? Yeah. And that was the basis for Josh Harris' book. Oh, really? Yeah. And he was so sick that I had to do his broadcast for him. Yeah. And um, that is really all that occurs to me. I didn't see much of the town. I was working constantly from early morning to late at night. What was the, the, the nature of Jackson's ineffectuality with, with Goering. He didn't seem to be prepared. He wasn't prepared for Goering's responses, which many of which could be guessed. I can't think of a specific case, yeah. but I had that impression yeah. constantly that he was not prepared. And Goering responded in a way that you could have guessed he would, but Jackson had no comeback. Second, his temperament. He lost his temper because he was feeling so badly. 
and altogether made a very bad impression because of lack of preparedness and a temperament not suited to the occasion. As a, as a keen observer, are you able to read in the faces of the judges any reaction or disappointment in the uh, progress that Jackson's making as he's supposed to be destroying the chief defendant there? Yeah, which was an easy job to do. Uh, no, the judges, uh, really, they were remarkable. They, they uh, registered nothing. Yeah. They were so terribly fair. Yeah. Especially the Chief Justice, his name Lawrence. Lawrence. Yes. He was awfully good. I think he's the one who persuaded this madman test that uh, this is not going to be a bad trial. Yeah. I have a chance. Yeah. Uh, no, they they didn't indicate anything like that. The uh, the Russian judges were not as uh, as uh, as fair. They were ready to condemn and yeah. to deny every yeah. appeal yeah. from the yeah. defendants. Yeah. But the uh, British judge was very impressive. I, I was in Berlin. Oh, that's right. That's so right. I saw most of them uh, uh, quite a few times. Can you compare the two Gehrings for me? Uh, yeah, the Gehring in the dock was more impressive and appealing than the Gehring <laughs> in, the, in the, and with the Reich Marshal's baton. Uh, he handled himself really well, cleverly. And it was a, really, everything was geared up to high noon. Jackson, the great Jackson, and Goering, the leading, uh, the heir to Hitler, would appear in confrontation. And it was a terrible disappointment as it collapsed. There's a shootout, it's no doubt who won. Yeah, Goering did. Yeah. And I don't know why. I, uh, everything, I, I never met Jackson before, but yeah. uh, that uh, meeting, I uh, thought he did a terribly bad job from the Faber Castle to, uh, to uh, uh, the courthouse. Yeah, and wh how far away would that have been? I guess it was about five or six miles. Oh, that far apart? Mm -hmm. I thought it was a walking distance. That's no, no. So, and and how, how were you uh, they shuttled? They buses running in yeah. most of the day. Yeah. But then they had to run a special bus for me after midnight because I, was, uh, I had to stay much later than anyone was justified in staying. So they got a jeep and they took me back. And where's the broadcast booth? It was uh, above the uh, courthouse, above the courtroom. Yeah. Sometimes you could see the courtroom from it. Sometimes there were obstacles. They were still building the place yeah. all the time. Yeah. And uh, you climbed up there and went up a, a ladder. To make a sure. ladder? Yeah. From the top of, <laughs> very top of the courthouse. And uh, I broadcast that. Yeah. I broadcast four or five times a day. What would be your 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 last time on the air? How what would be the latest when you would sign off? You mean in a day or your last broadcast at night? What time would it end? Oh, it, it, it was about seven o'clock in uh, in America, which would be a little after midnight. So you'd finish up at midnight there, get back to the Faber Castell, uh, and then be back on the job. Seven o'clock the next morning. Yeah, um, I want to go back to Pierre. My problem was washing. I simply could not wash. There were only four bathrooms for this gigantic kind of place, and I would get up just barely in time to catch the bus. No time to wash. I'd get back late at night, and there was no time to wash. Uh, that's <laughs> a dirty <laughs> job. <laughs> dirty job, dirty work, but somebody's got to do it. <clears throat> Why was Gehring? <coughs> more impressive as a uh, defendant in the docket than as a giant in the Third Reich. I think that would require some analysis uh, that I don't think I'm capable of. He was the, uh, he knew he was going to be killed. And when you've got nothing to lose and you have a certain innate cleverness, I think yeah. it shows and it comes out. He's a cornered rat? Yeah. But uh, he decides to do it with dignity, which he did. And he also knew he had his pill somewhere in his person, and he could take that at the last yeah. minute. So his fate was sealed. Uh, what did Johnson say about concentrating the mind by knowing you're going to be hanged? Well, yeah. he knew he was going to be yeah. hanged. Yeah. So his mind was concentrated. He had no future beyond this, while Jackson thought he did have a future. So um, it makes a difference. He simply knew his fate. He had nothing whatever to lose. Many of the others were unimpressive people, as you indicated. Right. Rubintrop was a most trivial man. 
it, it just showed here, but it showed too in his uh, in his conduct of foreign affairs. He was a trivial little fellow. Um, Stryker was a brute. <clears throat> I think he was only half uh, insane. He got his thrills out of, of beating people with whips. And uh, Funk was uh, who succeeded at shops in running the economy. He was a nobody. I guess he had a certain technical efficiency, which Hitler needed. Hess was crazy, just absolutely insane. Of course, they all had clever lawyers, so they didn't have to be very clever. You were impressed by the quality of the defense. Yeah. 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 You had the best lawyers Nazi Germany could provide. Of course, some of the others... Uh, here's, here's a list of them. I wonder how many of those you had known in uh, the other period. I didn't know them. I saw them quite yeah. a bit. But <clears throat> Keitel, Field Marshal Keitel, who was hanged, was uh, the head of the armed forces right. under Hitler. He negotiated the peace treaty with the peace uh, surrender with the French in the yeah. rail car and Fontaine. Fontaine. Yeah. And then I saw him last in Berlin in Marshal Zhukov's headquarters, which was a huge basketball court, the Karls Horst uh, racetrack area yeah. of Berlin. And he was brought in to sign the surrender to the Russians. Right. So I'd seen him quite a bit and, and on great occasions, and this was the last and greatest. And he was hanged, but he, was, he also was a nobody. He was the most unimpressive man. I'm sure that's one reason Hitler kept him. He didn't want any trouble with it. Sir David Maxwell Fife was very impressive. In what way? As a prosecutor, it had everything in order. He was not going to be surprised by anything, and he wasn't in, cross -exa in examining these people. He said something interesting about uh, Jackson's performance in his own memoirs. He said Jackson lacked the cross-examiner's fatal gift for leading the witness to the trap and springing it. Yeah. I think it, he probably had the ability, he just didn't exercise it. Yeah. And I think the, the Clark Clifford complex hit him. You know, you get to be so esteemed and so uh, incorruptible that you're easily corrupt. <laughs> <laughs> you really think that Abe Fortas decided, well, I am so above coach that I can afford to keep this uh, check for a while yeah. and no one will know it yeah. or we care about it. Yeah. Bill Rogers was here. He said he came to Washington to try the five percenters and stayed on to try to investigate all the people who committed <laughs> crime. He said they're all perfect people. Yeah. And they're so perfect that they, re they don't feel that they can be reproached. Sherman Adams was that way. Fortas was that way. And Clark Tucker was going to be that way. But I think Jackson had a little of that in that he was such an esteemed citizen in America that he didn't really have to repair as hard as the other yeah. did. He was naturally smart. It turned out you've you got to repair. Yeah. You've got to love detail. You can't generalize and just say you're an evil person. You've got to prove it. He, he was not prepared to do it. Uh, hardly Shawcross made a, a good impression, but not, not outstanding. Uh, Justice Lawrence, Judge Lawrence, was absolutely the most impressive person there. Do you think this is fair? Somebody described him in, in appearance and manner the other day as Rumpole. <laughs> He didn't explode. Rumpole explodes often. <laughs> Drinks more. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know Lawrence's habits. But he didn't explode. He was always calm. Yeah. And his judgment always seemed fair. Very yeah. impressive man. Burkitt, too, was impressive, but not so much as his uh, fellow. <clears throat> I did a television program with Burkitt for uh, uh, one of the television networks in Great Britain on mercy killing. He and a, a panel discussed mercy killing. We used uh, actors to act out actual cases yeah. in which doctors had killed people who had no chance of living. He passed judgments. The basis for my question, what I'm trying to get is some comparative sense of the amount of destruction in London, which we all thought was great, compared to Nuremberg. Incomparable. Nuremberg was... Uh, destroyed with a vengeance. Not just destroyed, but destroyed three or four times. Make the rubble bounce was Churchill's phrase. Yeah. It's uh, unnecessarily destroyed. It's a beautiful gem of an old city there. It was just smashed. 
There's nothing there. It's been rebuilt, and it's it's a bit of a it's not as good as it was. Yeah. The Germans are usually good at that sort of thing. They haven't done that well in Europe. But um, it was a, a degree of rubble that I had seen in Berlin because they did the same thing. Yeah. I found the trial less boring than I thought it would be. Really? Yeah, there were quite a few revelations coming up every day, things I never heard of. Bill Shire in his history says it is surprising how little we who lived in Germany knew. And that was he was sitting there listening to one revelation after another. So it became fascinating to me. Would that therefore confirm the position of many ordinary Germans that they didn't know what was going on? I think that's probably true, except those who lived right in the neighborhood of concentration camps yeah. and saw these people. But in Berlin, I had no idea that the concentration camps were like that. Yeah. And there was absolutely no hint that they were. Yeah. We were never allowed to go to a concentration camp, but just before the war, I told Talicious, the New York Times correspondent, uh, finally got permission to go to Dachau. Yeah. But they printed it up, and it was just an American penitentiary. That's all yeah. it was. So we had no notion what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I think most Germans are telling the truth. They didn't know. Exactly. The Jews, how they treated Jews. Now, on the uh, landing above my apartment on Wittenberg Platz, there were two Jewish women, very wealthy Jewish families, spoke English perfectly. And I thought, well, this is nice to keep a, a, a tie to the Jews and find out what's happening. But. Um, they indicated to me it wouldn't be wise. Don't maintain any relationship with us. And after a couple of months, I, I saw how precarious life was. The SS came and took them and sealed their apartment off with big strips of paper that yep. said, uh, closed by order of the Geheimstaatspolizei. And uh, a, a young Jewish a man uh, kind of adopted me. We met on the underground. And uh, he said, let's meet once every two weeks at a certain station and we'll go on the underground together. I'll tell you what I know. I said, that's great. Within two weeks, he was gone. Yeah. He, he was the one who told me they were already putting Jewish people like these two ladies I knew into cattle cars and taking them east to Polish concentration camps. That's all I knew, though. I didn't know what happened yeah. once they got there. I didn't assume the horror. In fact, the final decision had not yet been made the final decision to kill all Jews was made at the Lake Banze in Berlin, and that, that was two years after this. Yeah. We were absolutely ignorant. I tried very hard to establish a relationship with the Russian prosecution that took up a lot of time and got nowhere. The Russian radio invited Shire to make a, a brief broadcast for yeah. him. Well, Shire caught the flu. He said, will you do it for me? So I said, gladly. I did it and tried to establish a relationship. But they were impossible. Given this intense producing deadline pressure, I don't suppose you had a hell of a lot of time at that point to consider the propriety of these trials, the nature of the justice that's being practiced there? Well, I did. And I found it easy to reconcile it to myself. After a horror this great, the people who won were going to demand that somebody be punished. And this had to be done. This was the least damaging thing that could be done. Yeah. Uh, I just can't imagine the war ending without this. Yeah. And most of the crimes were crimes already, were, were agreements violated but already uh, signed on to by Germany. Yeah. International agreements, Geneva Accords and so on. So I think there was a body of law there yeah. which uh, uh, had to be applied. There's simply one of those inevitabilities. It had to be done together. We never had any qualms about it at all. Just a regret that Himmler and Hitler. Yeah, the stars are not there. Goebbels, Himmler, Hitler. That would have been wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Heydrich. Yeah, I think. <laughs> I went down in the, the bunker uh, shortly after Hitler killed himself. I was there for the, in Zhukov's headquarters. And they let us go and take a look. They wouldn't let us go all the way down. Yeah. yeah. Well, we saw the charred spots where the bodies had been out there. And what a mess the interior of that Reichskanzlei was. Episodes. All I remember is being in that lonely big hall all by myself at night at midnight, 
one night there was Martha. Who was the gal who worked for the Herald Tribune, the commentator? Well, there's Marguerite. Marguerite Egan. In uh, having a nervous breakdown. What was breaking her down? She was trying to be the best correspondent in the world and overdoing it, overcoming every obstacle. So she would sit there and work on her piece for the Herald Tribune all night, take it apart, put it back together again, and uh, she was they began to scream and they had to take her away. <laughs> you had to carry her off. <laughs> she was going home and going back with me, but then they had to take her off quickly yeah. and put her to bed. She was back in a few days, but she was a mess. Did she stay at the castle, castle as well? Yeah. She must have been a fascinating woman because on top of this professional drive and professional ability, everybody says she was a stunner. She was pretty good looking. But she got to be so tense, it was awful to be around. Oh, you, you know, Homer Biggert heard she uh, had a child, and he said, oh, I wonder who the mother was. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> Overcompensating too much. Yeah. Awful to be around. <laughs> I had a friend who was one of the prosecutors I've been to school with. And we met. And I complained to him that the American prosecutors were not uh, spectacular enough. They really had to make an impression because this is a drama as much as a trial. And <laughs> he went out, I forget his name, he went out and did his bit of prosecution and he was so, uh, so over-sensational. <laughs> he put on an act, almost a dance at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to please me. <laughs> it, it was a real, I think now it was probably a false issue, but we wanted more, more drama. We wanted evil showing up better for what it was. There was one gal, a French girl, who had taken, been taken off to Ravensbrück concentration camp. And she was brought in to testify against Goering. She had seen documents at the camp which involved Goering's name. And she, hate was in her eyes, smoldering as I've never seen it smolder. And she had to go out past Goering. And uh, she almost attacked him. She was just about to do so, and two guards moved in front of her. It's going to be quite something to see. I think that uh, with, just with adrenaline, she would have defeated Goering. <laughs> because of that, and she was just a, a, a very slim little girl. But I sat often with Biddle's brother, who was an artist, and he was making an artistic record of the proceedings. He would not talk about his brother at all on the, on the bench. What was he doing? Pencil sketches, charcoal, or what? And then he would fill them out later at the uh, at the uh, Faber Castle. He was doing it as a journalist. That's right. Strictly as a journalist. Yeah. What, what was his first name? And if I know, I'm sure I can find it. His, his unwillingness to d discuss his brother was was that because of the the, the nature of his brother's role or personal? I was to know the nature of his brother's role. Yeah. He didn't want to be the source of any uh, any uh, kind of information about his brother. He didn't want to be pumped. No, about his brother. Was he, a, was he a younger brother than Francis? I couldn't tell you. They were approximately the same age. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, every reporter is very concerned when he's on a story of how it's being played back home, how much attention... What sense of attention to the Nuremberg stories did you get? Tremendous attention. I, as I say, I was on the air every bloody day several times. Yeah. And it never stopped. And uh, they told me in New, from New York that uh, they appreciated it very much. Every, if you wanted anything good, they said, schedule Smith and Nuremberg. And they, every program was, uh, uh, was uh, decorated with one of these short things. They appreciated it very much. Interest did not lag. It was a new revelation every day, and you could tell the context of it and create quite a good story. And this was Merle in his administrative stage when you were... Oh, yeah. Actually, this was uh, Alan Jackson, who was one of the men who had a program and told me that all the others were trying to get program, uh, 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 contributions from Nuremberg because the stuff was so interesting. Yeah.
And I, I hoped it would go to decline after a while. It did not. When you left, did a new CBS guy come in? Yes. Um, I hired Edward P. Morgan because he was nearby and I needed someone badly. I think he may well have, been, have taken over. I'm very anxious to read your book. <laughs> <laughs>